Okay, folks, I'd like to uh, get back started for our afternoon session. Uh, hopefully you got a little bit to eat, but won't fall asleep. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Honjo-san, Shuji Honjo, who has been a friend of mine here in Japan for many years. Uh, also very helpful when we were running 500 startups. Uh, and uh, I guess he has a personal interest in healthcare and wellness since he now has a five-year-old uh, who is uh, wow. who's hopefully well. And uh, I'll let him make the introduction to the rest of our panelists. Please give a warm round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining this session. Uh, well, it is titled Life Science, Healthcare, and Wellness, but uh, let me uh, well, <laughs> use the words just healthcare, okay? Um, well, do you or your family have any health issues, including light ones like headache or back pain? Please raise, if yes, please raise your hand. Okay, more than half. So we have problems in healthcare field. Um, in Japan, this country spent $300 billion per year for medical cost. And in the United States, number one bankruptcy reason of US people is medical cost, as you know. So it's a big problem. Then we have technology innovation. So digital health, some research says now digital health market globally, $200 billion. And within 10 years, it will be tripled or uh, four, four times, well, quadrupled. So very big, big growth. But um, in addition to that, we have a lot of innovation. Then we have two speakers here from uh, wellness, well-being field, and also the healthcare. So both of them are investors now. So um, let me introduce Naoko first. So uh, please you, uh, show her slides. Hmm? Okay. All right. Please welcome Naoko. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sure that uh, you got full with lunch, and then I just going to make sure that you're not going to fall asleep. But. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to here to speak about well-being tech. Um, I am based in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, and I'm visiting Japan right now. And uh, well, I was born and raised in Japan, so this is my home country as well. A um, little bit about my background. It's been, it's been 25, over 25 years I've been living in the U.S., and I'm based in Palo Alto. Um, spent 17 years working for the large IT companies, including Yahoo and Microsoft. And after that, I started helping um, Taizo Son, uh, whom you met this morning sessions. Um, he is the founder of um, Mesoto, and I was helping him to um, Mesoto's expansion to the US market as well. And I have a privilege to work with um, uh, Yahoo Japan CEO as well, who I'm gonna talk next session as well. And right now I have my own fund called Niremia Collective, which is a well-being tech fund. And let me see. So um, uh, let me a little bit talk about Niremia Collective. Uh, Niremia Collective is well-being tech focus fund, and we partner with the transformative tech, which is the largest ecosystem community of the well-being technology. Uh, we have 9,000 members across 72 countries, and that membership consists of startup investors, academia, and in, um, corporate as well. So by tapping into the collective intelligence from the transformative tech, uh, we have this abundance of that, you know, deal sourcing and also, you know, doing the due diligence with them and making that, making sure that our portfolio company gets sufficient help from that networking effort effect. Um, we are very passionate about that invest and support the global expansion. Um, my tie to Japan, and I, I feel that, um, you know, bridge U.S. and Japan has been my passion. That's why I came to the U.S. to um, attend the graduate school. So uh, with my experience and, and then my partner, Nicole's um, transformative tech, we do, you know, making sure that we collaborate to create a well-being world. 
So talking a little bit about well-being tech, what is well-being tech? So basically, well-being is that a center is, you know, human happiness and health. So to be able to be healthy and happy, you want to do exercise, you want to eat well, you want to have these good community connections, and then really focus on that healthy lifestyle, the longevity and the stuff. So it's really touching every part of your life, that including the longevity, future of work, food tech, wellness mental, social, emotional health, and a smart city and so on. Basically, that well-being tech is the data-driven, personalized product and service that promote the behavioral change. And this is sort of amazing numbers that it's a 5.8 trillion market opportunities, and it's going to be 6.8 trillion market by 2024, which is just next year. And we categorize into the three uh, areas, mental, emotional well-being, marketplace, ah, sorry, workplace and life wellness, and human potential and performance. And this is that I'm really accelerating that adoption curve, uh, mainly because of that COVID, people who adapt that are, you know, well-being tech to really keep their mental, emotional health that the B2B picked up and, and then they really want to create this environment for the employees to tap into their health. So um, B2B adoption has been really accelerating and that created a huge market. Also, um, people cannot really, couldn't really go to this gym and stuff as well. So, um, you know, this real life um, can become digitized and then business model become that hybrid between that real life experience and digital model. And also that well-being and wellness become really accepted by that healthcare ecosystem. So that's why the B2B area is going to be, you know, it's accelerated and it continue to be accelerated as well. And it also quantified self. That means, you know, who wears Apple Watch, oops, you know, the garment and all that health tech stuff that really see your data, health and your mental health as a data to really manage yourself as well. So this is really happening right now. And well-being wellness tech landscape that people ask me what if there is real technologies and real product and a startup, there are lots of things happening right now. So thank you. So now, Cole, so why did you pick this sector? Because um, when you launch your new company uh, to invest in uh, startups, so why didn't you select like generative AI or other stuff? So um, generative AI is going to be the part of this well-being tech because the well-being tech, as I mentioned, it's, it's really data business. But the reason why I picked this one is I've been investing in that, you know, companies for a long time. And then, then one day I just realized that I really want to focus on the human centric technologies to invest in the technologies that make people's lives much better, richer and happier. And that's why I thought that a people's health and happiness is a center. And I want to look for the technologies really help um, empower the people as opposed to making that the rich, rich people already rich. Okay, so you had the personal passion uh, to look at this uh, sector and the plus that you described that the market was uh, big and changing and growing. Right. It's it's really growing sector as well. Like you know, how many people realize that I'm doing that COVID that you felt like really lonely, need to connect with the communities, but you really have to focus on your own health. That really COVID um, ironically make people wake up to pay attention to their mental, emotional health and then physical health as well. That's why market really grew so much and it continued to grow. And then also that, um, you know, Millennium and Gen Z, uh, they are really, really interested in that, you know, balanced life as well. Not, you know, chasing after becoming famous or making money. They really focus on the balanced life and then they pay attention to their mental, emotional health. That's why the adoption has been growing very fast. Very interesting. 
Okay, so uh, may I ask Tomoko? So I'll quick change this right there. Hey. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tomoko Inoue, and I'm a CEO of Omron Ventures. And let me briefly introduce myself. Um, after I was born in the States, grew up in the States and Germany and Japan, but now I'm based in Tokyo. And uh, I'm now running a, a CVC arm of uh, Omron Corporation. Uh, but before that, I was running a medical device venture capital under a Japanese government-backed investment firm uh, called uh, INCJ. And uh, at the time, uh, the, our vision was to develop the med medical device innovation ecosystem in Japan. And uh, we thought that to really create and develop those uh, innovation ecosystem in medtech field, probably the, there is uh, several milestones. Like uh, first one, uh, the uh, Japanese entrepreneurs uh, start up to get uh, a class four device, uh, Japanese FDA approval, PMDA's approval, we achieved. And uh, second one, the large Japanese corporation acquire those uh, startup and really uh, uh, scale up their business we achieved and third one uh the like silicon valley based uh startup at the acquired by a japanese uh large corporation and really expand the business uh, domain and we achieved but uh, i thought um this is not really enough to create and develop the ecosystem and i realized that still there's a lot of um great idea and smart people in large corporation and really we need to change those large corporation and uh, when I thought those kind of idea, uh, like I had a chance to meet the uh, CTO of Omron Corporation and heard their vision and story. And I thought this is really great opportunity to um, really uh, achieve uh, what I want to do. So decided to join. And since then, I'm running a, a CBC of Omron Corporation. And uh, I don't know how many know about uh, uh, Omron, so let me briefly introduce, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> introduce about Omron. So um, actually, um, probably nobody really knows about this, but uh, the founder of Omron, Kazuma Tateishi, is the first person that founded the first commercial venture capital in Japan, uh, Kyoto Enterprise developed in 1972. And he really... Uh, contributed to um, really uh, like uh, the educate and uh, support the first gen generation of entrepreneurs in Japan. And uh, also um, there's a lot of um, innovation first invented by Omron, uh, not only healthcare, but also other like uh, social infrastructure area. Um, for example, it will, uh, in 60s and 70s, uh, he uh, invented the digital traffic signals and uh, automated ticket gates and also the former version of ATM, uh, online caching dispenser. And the uh, like, vision of Omron is um, really uh, solve the social problem by innovation. And the founder is really um, interesting uh, person. And uh, whenever he's so about the like uh like uh the moving things like uh blood or car or like cash he really want to uh, control it and uh, sense it control it and optimize it so that's why he invented those uh things and also he uh created the uh, blood home use blood pressure monitor market from scratch so um some of you probably have um, the uh, blood pressure monitor in home. Thank you, <laughs> being a royal customer. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, in seventies, there were no one even think to monitor the blood pressure at home. But he strongly believed that blood pressure is a really good measurement to control the health condition. So. Uh, collaborated with clinicians and established a guideline of blood pressure monitoring. And then there's a large uh, global market. And uh, yeah, many of you may um, use the Omron's blood pressure at home. And uh, so I um, 
uh, really, um, there's a like really innovation uh, and future centric uh, DNA in Omron. So I thought really uh, collaborate, like adding on top of the Omron's like sensing controlling technology and business uh, asset, uh, the um, startups, uh, cutting edge AI or robotics or security or energy kind of um, uh, technology. And we can really create the future of healthcare, future of smart city, future of factory. And future of healthcare, um, the nobody gets sick and everybody can do whatever they want and they can uh, eat whatever they want to eat. And automatically, autonomously, uh, like being uh, healthy and complete the full potential of uh, their lives. The kind of future I really want to um, create. And I've been using this slide since like five, six years ago. And at that time, probably uh, not, uh, not so many people really believe that we can achieve those future. But um, since COVID, everybody really used the online um, like telemedicine or many um, like digital therapeutics things. And I believe, I really feel that these future is coming now. So um, yeah, I believe that we can be healthy and no worry really get sick future will come soon. Thank you. So from your, uh, as an in investor persp perspective, the, what is the, uh, your view of this, uh, especially healthcare uh, sector? Because um, you in invested in uh, not only the medical device, but also the nursing care and, and well, broad stuff, and both in Japan and the US. So, so um, I I'll invest uh whatever is the cutting edge and really uh tackling to the like forefront of the problem. So, um. The we invested in the uh one of the startup we invested in uh, Japan is the dementia. Um, uh, they are developing the um really uh like intervention uh kind of tool uh for dementia uh uh patients, and uh I invested in that startup in Japan because Japan is really facing those like dementia. Uh, dementia is a really um, severe social problem in Japan. And um, really, we really face the the most, uh, like the highest level of the problem uh, comparing other uh, world. So uh, from Japan, we can really uh, create the really cutting edge uh, solution. So I believe that. So I invested in those uh, dementia field in Japan. But also the like uh, digital therapeutics or digital health kind of things. Uh, Japan is still uh, the digitalization of the uh, electric uh, health record level is really low. And uh, still, we need to uh, really uh, facilitate those um, uh, social infrastructure in medical like field as well. So uh, most of the really uh, first kind of solution from digital health field is coming out of US or like uh, Europe or Northern Europe. So um, I've always seen those uh, really cutting edge new solution uh, globally and whenever or whatever they can, uh, I believe that they can achieve the like really first class, uh, global level first class solution, I invest. So. Okay, so um, may I ask two of you, both of you, then, um, my what perception these days is um the in this country there are lots of very good uh, people, researchers, scientists, and and also sciences. However, the ecosystem here is premature, especially in healthcare. So I encourage them to consider or even move to the United States or other countries. Um, so. What do you, what is the perspective or, or the what kind of strategy uh, do you take for finding the investment? So I primarily focus on the US market and you encourage your Japanese startup to 
come to the US or other countries to kind of expand their business opportunities and stuff. Okay. So and um I guess the healthcare system, um, that each country has their own healthcare governance and stuff. And then their data um, you know, utilization is very much different. That US is very loose and then Japan is semi you know, stricted. And in Europe, it's very, very stricted as well. So that without really understanding the opportunities and how things going to work out, um, oftentimes it might be difficult really thinking about this country and then cultures and then expanding their business to outside of the culture. And then this healthcare system is something that are very, very difficult to do. Uh, having said that, um, there are a lot of collaboration opportunities. Let's say in Japan market, there is that a lot of great sensor technologies coming out from the US or Europe. And then, then Japanese com companies can just, or startup companies just to take the sensor technologies and then, then build on top of it with that, you know, Japan specific UI, UX, and then addressing this data requirement from the government and stuff so that they can create something that very local. But at the same time, if Japan come up with this basis of technologies that can be utilized by the other countries, then they can expand and then, then localize it in local so that they can do the global stuff. But then always really understand the market without expanding. And then also the partnership is a key. Uh, you can learn so much from the partners. So, um, you know, um, this this area is something that it's not so easy, but at the same time, if you find that a good partner is a good, you know, help, then that collaboration can be um, possible as well. So you can create a win-win situation in the end. So Tomoko, so pre previously you mentioned that maybe in Japan, Japanese people are very good at from zero to one, but <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh... Even Japanese uh, don't believe that uh, we're good at zero to one innovation. But actually, there's a lot of like um, innovation invented by Japanese people, and also in medical device field as well. Um, actually, there were really clear um, sketch of the surgical robot in 1970. By, made by um, Japanese uh, physician in 1970, and we uh, we've seen in many animation that like robots is really treating uh, the patients, but really we didn't really make it as a like real uh, surgical robot, and uh, Da Vinci is coming out from Silicon Valley. So, yeah, I believe that we have the idea and we don't know to make it as a business. But recently, there's a lot of like entrepreneurs coming out from Japan and uh, lots of like these like US Japan kind of collaboration activities are really um, developing and everywhere. So, I think we can like collaborate. If we can clove it more, and then I think we can make something dream to comes true. So, yeah, that's my view. Thanks. So the time is well. <laughs> okay. So um. So let me close. So um. Please give the final comment from both of you. Um. So um. Let me see. Um, I myself have some health scare last year and, you know, I woke up in the morning and all of a sudden that I have this face paralysis, which I thought that I was just, um, the end of the world. And then, you know, I didn't know that my stress level was so high because I didn't really pay attention to my mental, emotional health. So, you know, I thought about it and then they start paying attention to that, you know, if I'm under the big stress, so making sure that I breathe and making sure I exercise and then, then making sure that I can be healthy, not just physically, but also mentally as well. And I really think that, you know, people, if they lose that, you know, mental, you know, health, then 
all the life around you kind of crumble. So and uh, my last comment is that there are a lot of solutions that well-being tech really help you to understand your own mental, emotional health. And then, then from there, you know, you can kind of start really thinking about the families and pay attention to yourself, your health. And then, then there is a technology at your hand really help you to elevate the, your performance levels and stuff. So and we are here to uh, make an investment in a startup companies and um, technologies. So if you come across any good solutions or companies, and if you have any questions about which solution can be really good to address your you know, mental, emotional health, and, and then physical health as well, uh, please um, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, time flies. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, there's a lot of new technologies. Um, now I'm wearing the Aura Ring, um, Apple Watch, uh, sometimes Omron's blood pressure monitor. And uh, really, they really control myself and really uh, limit myself to drink too much and uh, um, uh, sleep well and really um, like to keep my health condition. So um, I think as I mentioned in the, like, uh, the opening, um, we really uh, can be healthy and whatever we eat or whatever we do, and ultimately we can control my health, our health conditions. So there's a really big um, needs and also there's a really like these with these technology we can like make our life much better so um there's a big investment opportunity and also big um like our like happiness uh future is uh, like happy future is there so please use this technology and uh please be aware of those like uh new things and be healthy. Thank you very much. So, thank you a lot. So then, uh, please enjoy the next great speaker. Thank you, folks, very much. Uh, Noko, I believe you're going to be helping moderate the next speaker. Okay, great. And. Uh, so uh, the next presentation is going to be in Japanese. So for English speakers in the audience, you might want to use your translation devices. Uh, and then make sure that's tuned to the right channel so you're not listening to Jazz 97, the, the lazy station. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, miyasaki -san. Uh, uh. Can I start? Should I wait? Hi. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I あの、there's a receivers that you might want to use it. Okay. All right. <laughs> <笑>はい。えっとですね、次のスピーカーなんですけれども、あの、東京福都知事で、あの、私のあの、中に20年代の友達でありますえっと宮坂学さんです。よろしくお願いします。どうも、こんにちは。私がなんでここに座ってるかっていうバックグラウンドをちょっとお伝えしたいんですけれどもあの宮坂さんとはですねあの2023、2000、2003年ですねヤフーに入社した以来えっとずっと一緒にお仕事をさせていただいておりまして
、でまあ一緒に仕事しようよっていうのをお声がけいただいてでその日本に新しいメディアを作りましょうっていうのでコインデスクをその日本に持ってきてコインデスクジャパンを運営したりとかしたんですけれどもある時宮坂さんがあの日本でブロックチェーンウィークをしましょうと。いうことでですねあのこれからちょっとプレゼンテーションに行ってくるよというところでの東京都知事のですね小池さんのところにプレゼンテーションしに行かれたんですけれどもそうするとそのままあのリクルートされて帰ってこない人になっちゃったと。いうことで,ですね。あの、あの、あの、政策が、あの、こんな、こう、規制産業だから政策側にこうおいでよというふうに言われて、俺行くことにしたからさ、と言われて、それで、あの、去っていかれたという形なんですけれども、あの、ずっと仲良くしていただいてて、今回こういったですね、あの、光栄な席を設けさせていただいたということになります。じゃあ、あの、少し、あの、自己紹介をちょっとお願いしたいんですけれども、お願いします。はい、あの、奥本さんとは本当にもう20年ぐらいね、一緒に仕事をさせてもらっていて。で、ちょうど4年前に東京都に営業に行ったんですよ。あの、ブロックチェーンとか、ライドシェアやりましょうよっていう。行政が変わらない、街が変わらないとできないんですよね。なんで、あの、やりましょうよって営業に行ったら、その後電話かかってきて、ものすごい面白かったと。あなたがやらないって言われたんですよね。で東京ってやっぱり世界で一番大きな街じゃないですか。やっぱりやってみたいですよね。何が起きるんだろうと。実際に行ってみてやってることはブロックチェーンじゃなくて、どうやって行政から紙を減らすのかって仕事を今やってるとか、すごいギャップがすごいんですけど、それも含めて楽しんでやっています。はい、じゃあ、あの、日本を、あの、代表するですね、インターネット会社であるヤフーの社長をしてらしたわけではないですか。だからそれずっとヤフーでやってらしてて、で、最初、東京都庁にその、転職されたわけなんですけれども、すごく環境が変わったと。いうことをよく話されてましたけれども、最も驚かれたことって何ですかはい、あのー、最初に行って一番驚いたのが、Wi-Fi がなかったんですよ。<笑>すごい。<笑>もうびっくりして、東京に Wi-Fi のないとこってあるんだと思って。<笑>ランドラインだった。そうなんですよね。だから最初にやったのは自分であのポケット Wi-Fi ってあのモバイルルーターを自腹で買いに行ってですね。<笑>で、モニターも本当そのちっちゃなノートブックしかなかったんで、もう自腹で、もう大きなあのディスプレイを買って、で、ビデオ会議やろうと思ってもカメラもないから全部自腹で買って、普通に手続きすると半年ぐらいかかるって言われたんで<笑>、もう自腹で買うからって言って、まあ、全部買い物したのが最初でしたね。はい、<笑>それであの、じゃあ,あの、インターネット業界のど真ん中から Wi-Fi のない環境に行かれたじゃないですか。はい、でも完全な、全くなんかその、なんていうのか畑違いの世界にあの足を突っ込まれたという形なんですけれども、はい、その w i f i がなかったっていう話もびっくりなんですけれども、うん、多分その w i f i がない環境をそのサポートしているその、まあ、職員の皆さんがいらっしゃるということで、うん、多分そこにいろんな理由があったと思うんですけれども、その都庁のデジタル化をその進めるにあたって、どのようにその都庁の職員の方々の,その意識を変えていかれたりとか、そのじゃあ、インターネットからどんどん変わられて、こちらはこちらの事情がある中で、どういうふうに進められたんですか、改革を。まあ、あの、まずやっぱり仲良くなることは大事だなと思ったんですよね。あんまりこう、あの、自分はデジタルのことを知ってるって、君たちは知らないから、いくら聞けってやっても、あんまうまくいかないなと思いまして、まずやっぱちゃんとこう、関係を作るっていうんですか、それと非常にこう、営業に近い、営業マンみたいな感じですよね。そうですね。そうやってちょっとずつ理解をしてくれると増やすというアプローチを取ってましたね。そうなんだ。まあ、あの、宮坂さんって、ヤフー時代からでもそうなんですけど、すごくそのトランスペアレンシーっていうのを大事にしてらしてて、もうなんかその、今回、私がすごくびっくりしたのは、あの、東京の副都知事になられて、自分の成績簿っていうのを出されたんですよね。で、それをそのパーンとか、そのソーシャルメディアで送られて、あの、まあ、一期勤めました。4年間なんですけれども、それで、こんなことをやってきました。これはできてきます。これはまだまだ、ちょっと頑張るので、まあ、これ初心表明みたいな形で、また2期目も頑張りますよっていうことを出されていったと。で、それって、そのすごく、あの、まあ、なんていうのかな、すごく新鮮だと思うし、そういったことで、その、まあ、ね、副都知事が成績簿を出すということは、あの職員の方々もいろいろとこう自分の,なのことがどんなふうに社会にインパクトを与えているかというのをこう初めて
、我々みたいなこう庶民が見ることができたと思うんですけれども、あの、今回じゃあその社内の改革をどんどんどんどん、まあ社内とかその都の改革をどんどんどんどん進められて、最初はその、まあ、と、まあ、その都庁の改革を進められて、で、今、そのイノベーションとして第二的目に入られて、そのグローバルにどんどんいろんなことを進めていこうというふうにしてらっしゃるんですけれども、そのグローバルの規模の大きなイニシアチブとして、その今後どういった取り組みをしようと思っていらっしゃるか、少し詳しくお話しいただけますかわ、はい、かりました。あの、まあ、一期目は、あの、僕はデジタル、デジタルガバメントを作るっていうお仕事をやってきたんですよね。で、これは、あの、2期目もやろうと思っています。で、もう一つ新たにですね、今日、まあ、来て、来た主題、テーマでもあるんですけど、やっぱりあの、東京都を、スタートアップとかですね、えー、チャレンジャーが、もっと活躍できる街にしたいな、っていうのをやりたいと思ってるんですよ。で、その中で、寿司テック東京というふうなですね、イニシアティブをということで。出るかなすみません。あの、プレゼンテーションもお渡ししてると思うんですけど、映してもらえますかはい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はなんか意味があるんですか後ろに。ヤフーもなんか意味があったじゃないですか。はい、グーグルなんか意味があったんですけど。ねはい、あのー、東京都を魅力的にもっとしたいっていう思いは、知事も職員も持ってるんですよね。うんうん、まあそういった時に、あのー、東京都って今人口1400万人いるんですよ、うん。なんで、あと首都圏って言われてるグレーター東京だと3000万人、うん。多分世界最大級、多分一番だと思うんですよね。うん、でもまあ、あのー、人数がたくさんいたら、いい街なのかってちょっと違うじゃないですか、こう。それは、ちょっと都市としての魅力ってあるのかっていうと、ちょっと違うと思うんですよね。やっぱりどういう都市がやっぱ魅力的なんだろうかと。これから魅力をもっとこう持つんだろうかって考えたときに、やっぱりいろんな分野で挑戦する人の人数多い街が魅力的なんだと思うんですよ、こう。挑戦しない人がいっぱいいても、それは単に人が多いだけの街で、いろんな分野、例えばビジネスだったり、ビジネスはスタートアップって言うですよね。アートとか、スポーツの世界とか、まあ、学問の世界とかね。まあ、東京だったら食文化がやっぱ大事なんで、こう、レストランの世界とか、あれとあらゆるジャンルで挑戦者がどんどんどんどん東京から生まれて、そして世界から、東京都で挑戦をしたいって来てもらって、うん、そして我々は行政として挑戦者を応援するっていう、まあ、そういった都市にならないと、こう、魅力はやっぱり東京って失っちゃうんじゃないのかなと思ったんですよね。まあ、その中で、特にあの、ビジネスの挑戦者っていうのは、スタートアップの人たちが一番、まあ分かりやすいですよね。まあだから、スタートアップをもっと応援する、まあ、東京都になろうっていう、まあプロジェクトが、まあちょうど去年から、去年の、ね、今頃かな、8月にやろうっていうのが決まりまして、で、今年の4月にですね、東京都庁として、初めてスタートアップを専門に見る部署ができたんですよ。で、今80人ぐらいのメンバーで、まあやってるんですけどね、まあそういう部署を作りました。で、まあ、いくつかいろんなことをやるんですけど、今日はちょっとぜひちょっと二つご紹介したいんですよね。で、一つは、まあ、寿司テック東京っていうのを来年の5月に東京都で開催しますんで、もうぜひ来てくださいというのが一つ目のお願いですね。で、二つ目が、東京イノベーションベースっていう、こう、スタートアップ拠点を来月からできますんで、ぜひ使ってくださいと。なんていうか、寿司テックと、東京イノベーションです。この二つだけ覚えていただければ、私は来た甲斐があったかなと思ってます。<笑>で、あの、寿司テックというのはですね、うんはい、なんかその、すごい、まあ、日本を代表するキャッチーな名前なんですけれども、はいはい、これは、その、頑張る人たちを、まあ、応援したりとか、情報交換をしたりとか、うん、なんかコラボレーションが生まれるプラットフォームとして、今後も生きていくようなものだと思っているんですけれども、はいはい、あの、これって、でそのグローバル規模での,、うんそのまあ、東京をイノベーションハブとして、外に打っていくための大きなイベントというふうに捉えてらっしゃいますか、はいはい、そうです。あの、寿司テック東京っていうのは、決してその、あの、寿司のイベントじゃないんですよね。<笑>そう<笑>あの。回転寿司の新しい技術とかやるわけじゃないけど。<笑>で、これあの、サスナブルハイシティテック東京で楽なんですよ。<笑>はい、そ,のそれをこう合体させて、寿司テック東京って名前にしてるんですよねそこにそのサステイナブルという名前をつけたのは、どういったここ意味があるんですかこれは、これですね、うんあの、私のボスの
、小池百合子知事の強い思いがあって、やっぱり都市っていうのは、サスナブルな都市にもう一回作り変えないといけないって強い願い、思いを持ってらっしゃるんですよね。僕は全くそれはその通りだと思うんですよ。やっぱり今、人類の5割が今、都市に住んでるんですよね。今から7割住むって言われてるんですよ。そ逆に考えると、その人類の問題のほとんど都市で起こってるんですよね。<笑>まあ気候危機もそうだし、エネルギーとか、ちゃんとした水を飲めるようにするとか、食料の生産とかね、ゴミを捨てないとか、うんまあ、こういったものをやるのに、やっぱ都市をもう一回こう作り変えないといけないんですけど、まあ、そこはもういろんなテクノロジーが必要で、うん、国内だけのテクノロジーで足りずるに、スタートアップの力も借りたいし、そして世界中の新しいテクノロジーなんかもどんどんどんどん東京都に取り入れて、やっていかないと作り変えないということで、うんまあ、そういったテクノロジーを使って街を、世界最大の街を作り変えてみたいっていう人が集まるような、そんなイベントにしたいと思ってます。なるほど。それで寿司テック東京と。はい、そうです。このあの、ロゴは寿司をイメージしてらっしゃるんですかそうですね。はい。<笑>一応、あの、今日なんかイベントのロゴに出るなと思ってるんですけど、<笑>あの、寿司をイメージしたロゴです。はい。あの、ブロックチェーンウィークをしようよといったところからですね、はい、世界の、あの、まあ、50万人とかのですね、はい、人々を集めるような大きなイベントにしようとしてらっしゃるんですけれども、はいうんうねはい、もう少し詳細についてお話しいただけますか、はい、ありました。あの、イベントはですね、3つで構成されています。で、1つ目は、テクノロジーを持っているスタートアップや日本の大企業が、まあ、世界の大企業が参加するテクノロジーのプログラムがあります。でこれは去年あのシティテック東京という名前で実はちょっと先行開催していて、えー、3分の2はですね、海外からの出展企業で、オール英語でやります。今年もオール英語でやります。はい。で、2つ目が、あのー、世界の都市のトップが集まるシティリーダーズサミットっていうんですよね。これは、あの、技術だけがいくらイノベーションが起きても、政策で、政策のイノベーション。例えば、今、東京都っていうのは、新しい家を建てるときには、原則、太陽光パネルを屋根につけてくださいねっていう政策を、イノベーションを起こしてるんですよね。そうなんですね。そうすると、どうやって安価な太陽光パネルを作るんだとか、20年後の廃棄の問題出ますよね。どうやって安全に、ローコストに太陽光パネルを廃棄するのかっていう問題も出てくるし、蓄電池の問題も出てくるんで、やっぱりテクノロジーのイノベーションと政策のイノベーションをこうセットでやらないと街って変わんないじゃないですか、こう。なので、まあ世界のいろんな市長とか、まあ市長級の人が集まって、あの自分たちの街をどうやってサスナブルに作り変えていくのかってこと、政策のイノベーションの意見の交換するのがシティリザーズサミットってやつです。で、最後の三つ目が、あの今度はこれ都民向けのプログラムなんですよね。どうしてもテクノロジーイベントっていうのはこう、テクノロジーの好きな人がいっぱい集まって楽しそうにやってるっていう雰囲気になりやすくて、それだとやっぱり市民の理解って得られにくいじゃないですか、こう。で、ましてや、サスナブルな都市に作り変えていくときには、テクノロジーでも政策でもだけダメ,ダメで、やはり市民、市民、市民の方が一人ずつ理解いただいて、自分たちのライフスタイルを少し変えるとかね、そういったことってやっぱすごく大事なんですよね。市民にどうやって、街をどうやってアップデートするためにどういうふうにすればいいのかっていう、まあ、プレゼンテーションもやっぱ我々がやりたくって、これがあの、まあ、ショーケースって言うんですけどね、東京都の、東京都は未来の東京をこんなふうにしたいと思ってるっていう、まあ、ショーケースをやる。この3つの、まあ、スタートアップ向け、えー、そして、まあ、あの、自治体のトップ向け、東京の市民向けっていう、この3つで構成をしているつもりです。はい。なるほど。あの、この5月の15日から16日開催っていうのも、日本がちょうどその季節的にもとっても気持ちのいい季節なんですけれども、はい、ここは何かやっぱりその集客するにあたって、海外のお客様もどんどん来ていただいて、グローバルなイベントにしていきたいというですね、こう、心持ちを持ってらっしゃるんですか、はい、そうですね。あの、ま、今まで、あのー、東京都で、また日本で、毎年この時期に必ずやりますからねっていうイベントがなかったなと思ってるんですよね。なんで、ぜひ5月は世界の方が、あの東京に行こうと。毎年毎年スケジュールにしてもらえるようなものをぜひみんなで作っていきたいなと思ってるんですよね。で、実は一番いい季節です、5月っていうのは。本当に東京も日本全体もとっても綺麗で天気もよくっていい季節です。で、寿司テック東京自体は、まあ一泊二日間で終わってしまうんですけど、こんなにいい時期に二日で帰ってもらうのはもったいないと。申し訳ないと思いまして<笑>、今回はですね、日本中のいろんなスタートアップシステムや大企業の方、CVC の方、アクセラレーターの方と話をして、もしイベントをやるんであれば、この時期の前後にやりませんかって言ってるんですよね。まあ、それと、この2日間だけ目指してきてもらえれば、前後にきっと
、どんなジャンルのスタートアップの人も、た多分自分にぴったりした,スタ特別なスタートアップイベントに日本中で開催されることになりますんで、それに参加できますんで、ぜひこの2日間プラスアルファ前後で日程を取ってもらって、日本のいろんなスタートアップエコシステムの人と交流をしてもらえればなと思っています。なんかあのイメージを聞いてると、アメリカのサウスバイサウスウェストのように、はいまあ、この時期になったら飛んで、<笑>でそのまあメインのイベントがいろいろあって、テーマについて話し合うんですけれども、周りにまたいろんなイベントがポコポコポコポコ入って、はい、そのライクマインディーな人たちが集まって、そのまあそうですね、そこの地域の未来ですとか、またはその土地の,都市の未来ですとか、国の未来とか、ひいてはそのグローバルな未来を一緒に語り合って考えていくというふうなイベントになっていくんですけれども、もしかしてこの寿司テック東京も、そのまあ、テックという名前はついてますけれども、将来的にはサウスワイ・サウスウェストみたいに、グローバルなそのいろんなその方々を呼んで、まあ、イノベーションについて語ったりですとか、サステイナビリティについて語ったりですとか、みんながよりよくそのウェルビーイングでハッピーに生きていくためにどういうふうなそのものづくりを行政から変えていくスタートアップも絡んでいくっていうところでこう一つのこう,うねりみたいなものを作っていくような場にしていこうというお考えをお持ちですかはいあのー、サウスバイサウスベストは実は一回も行ったことがないんですけど<笑><笑>そうか、まあ、行った人から本当に楽しいイベントだよっていうのは聞いていてでやっぱエンターテインメントとかねこう音楽とテクノロジーがミックスして、本当に楽しいイベントだっていうのを聞いていて、やっぱそういうの僕いいと思うんですよね都。都会らしいなと思うんですよ。テクノロジーだけって別にどこでやったっていいんですけど、まあ、東京のようにこう歴史と文化とエンターテインメントがね、たくさんある街で、テクノロジーだけでやるのは本当にもったいないと思ったんですよね。そういった時に、東京がテクノロジーと組み合わせるのは何がいいかなと思って、やっぱ一つ風土はあるなと思ってですよね。まあ、世界で一番ミシュランのレストランが多い街って言われてますんで、まあ、この、まあ、そういうのも実はちょっと寿司テックっていう名前にありまして、まあ、この5月の時期に、毎年テクノロジーの関係者、行政の関係者、そして東京都民みんなが集まって、都市をどうやって、自分たちの都市どうやって作り変えるんだっていう議論をして、その時にものすごい美味しいものを食べてもらいたいなと。そんなものにしていきたいなと思います。あのー、そうですね。これ、まあ、じゃあ、今年だけ、来年だけのイベントではなくって、もう2025年も2026年もあるということで、あの皆さんカレンダーをぜひマークしてですね。はい、毎年あります毎年のイベントになるので、はい、で必ず美味しい食べ物が、あの、が食べられてで、しかも素晴らしい方々とネットワークできて、でそれプラスいろんなイノベーションの最先端のところにこう行けて、それプラスまたそれを手掛けていらっしゃる人たちとのコラボレーションができるという素晴らしい機会になると思いますので、ぜひぜひあのカレンダーをマークしておいてください。あのこの時期、フライトが高くなる前に日本にぜひ来るように<笑>、スケジュールを組んでおいていただければと思います。じゃあ、あのもう一つのですね、先ほどおっしゃってたあのイニシアティブなんですけれども、はい、あの東京イノベーションベースというですねあの、またハブとなるような場所を作られて、そこでなんかエコシステムのようなですね、活動をしていくと。まあ、持続的なスタートアップのエコシステムを東京で作っていくと。いうふうなことをおっしゃいましたけれども、この背景にあるお考えというのを少しお聞かせ願えますか。はい。あのー、まあ、東京都としてスタートアップをもっともっと応援しようっていう取り組みをね、やるっていうのをしましたけど、まあ、一つこう、フラッグシップになる拠点は一つ作りたいなっていう話になったんですよね。で、そうしたときに、東京のエコシステムの,あの、まあ、特徴じゃないかなと僕は思うんですけど、あの、コアになるですね、場所が非常に分散してるんですよね。自立分散型のエコシステムって東京らしいなと思うんですよね。これ東京の街そのものもそうでして、まあ、ここに皆さんいるのはこう丸の内とか有楽町っていう東京の真ん中にいるんですけど、実は渋谷とかですね、新宿とか池袋とか、本当にいろんなこうコアになる街が東京にはこう分散して、それがネットワークで繋がっているのが東京の街の特徴なんですよねで。同じようにエコシステムも非常にこう自立分散型になっていて、例えば AI だったら本郷っていうところにすごくありますし、それから、ライフサイエンスだったら日本橋っていうところとか、あと横浜、つくばとかにね、ディープテックはつくばにすごく集積してるし、まあ、デジタル系だと渋谷とか六本木とかですね、それぞれのこう拠点がいろんなところにこう分散してるんですよね。で逆にそれが、あのー、まとめてアクセスするのが非常に難しくなってるっていうところがやっぱり弱点としてありましたんで、今回この東京イノベーションベースっていうのを作って、今3カ所たくさん募ってるんですけど、スタートアップそのものを集めるっていうよりも、エコシステムの、まあ、エコシステムビルダーっていうんですかね、エコシステムを作ってらっしゃる
CVC の方とか、アクセラレーターの方とか、大学の関係者とか、国の人とか、そういった人を集めてるんですよ。まあ、それによって、ここにさえ来れば、まあ、自分にぴったりの、まあ、分散化されたエコシステムにアクセスできるっていう環境を作ったり、エコシステム同士でこうコラボレーションしながら、大きなイベントをやってみたりですね、アクセラレーションやっていこうそんな、まあ、行政は多分そういうニュートラルなので、うん、非常にやりやすいんで、まあ、そういった特徴を持たせています。まあ、じゃあ、場所を提供するので、はい、そこに入るのはスタートアップに限らず、投資家の方々とか、うん、まあ、そこにその、あのそこにエンゲージする方々を入れて、うん、でその場所はあるんだから、うん、もう好きにこのなんか配合して、はい、新しいものを作っていってよという形ですよね。そうですね今あの、中身をどう作るかも含めて、今までは行政が自分だけで考えて、作りました、使ってくださいってのが多かったんですけど、今回ちょっと違うやり方をとっていまして、我々のスターティングメンバーというふうに呼んでるんですけど、スターティングメンバーになる企業の方にたくさん集まってもらって、一緒になってどういうふうに作っていこうかっていうのをやってるんですよね。うん、で、その中で、あ、ちょっと一個前ですか一、はい、個前の、あの、まあ、来月からオープンして、4月から正式稼働を始めるんですけど、もう一個フリーってありますけど、うん、まあ、自由に使っていいですよっていうのとですね、これもう一個無料って意味なんですよね。無料です。無料です。<笑>で、当面は、あの、私なんかも使っていいんですもちろんですよ。素晴らしい。あの、我々としてはですね、ここにちょっと写真ありますよね。今、あの、単なるスペースなんですよ。これね。うん、はい。で、ここに、人が全然来ないとですね、行政って大問題になっちゃうんですよ。<笑><笑>だからむしろ、どんどんどんどん使っていただきたいんですよ。いろんなプログラムとか、ね。海外から来る人も大丈夫。もうウェルカムです、ね。ウェルカム。例えば、うん、海外のウェルビーインテックってこうなってるよっていうイベントをやってくる、うん、もうめちゃくちゃウェルカムです。あ、ここでも勝手に私が人呼んでやっちゃっていい。フリーです。そうなんですね。<笑>とにかく、まあ、稼働率上げた方が絶対いいですからね。うんうん、まあ、その後のことは考えますけど。<笑>とにかく、まずは皆さんにどんどんどんどん使っていただいて、国内の方、海外の方がここに来てもらって、で、我々は、あの、東京中のエコシステムにアクセスできるネットワークを今作ってますんで、まとめて声かけて、皆さんがミートアップできるような、そんな環境にしていきたいと思ってます。はい、あの、今日海外の方がたくさん参加してらっしゃるんですけれども、うん、これも日本人に限らず、あの、どこの国からいらしても利用ができるということなので、うん、ぜひぜひこの機会を皆さんご利用していただければというふうに思います。で、えっと、これはですね、あの、なんか、トレーニングプログラムですとか、あとその、まあ、いろんなそのスタートアップなんかのですね、こう、一緒にコラボレーションする機会なんかも、こう、ここで作っていきたいというふうに思ってらっしゃるんですよね。うんはい、そうですね。今、あの、まあ、日本にたくさんある、そのアクセラレーターの方とも話をしていて、まあ、アクセラレーションプログラムをここでもちょっと特別に作ってもらえる話にもなってるんですよね。まあ、そういったアクセラレーションプログラムを、例えば、まあ、自分たちの夢としては、うん、日本の人が日本の企業に提供するだけじゃなくて、海外のアクセラレーションプログラムの方に来ていただいて、うん、で、日本の企業にてスタートアップに提供したり、場合によっては、まあ、将来的にはこの宿泊設備みたいなのも考えたいなと思ってるんですよね。海外のアクセラレーションプログラムが来ます。日本のスタートアップと海外のスタートアップが一緒になって、設備に泊まりながらですね。はいはい、一緒になって、ああ、宿ですね。話し合いながらやるみたいなね、うん。なんかそういう世界なんかをいつか作れると、スタートアップが将来的にもっとこう、都市を超えて、グローバルにね、活躍するときにとてもいい拠点になるかなと思ってますので、はい、そういったアクセラレーションプログラムを持ってらっしゃる方もぜひ誘致したいなと思ってます。うん、なるほど。であの、東京をそのアジアのいや世界のイノベーションハブとしての地位を確立していきながらですね、あのこちらから情報をその、今までは取りに、日本から情報を世界に取りに行かないといけなかったんですけれども、情報のフローを東京にもこう呼び寄せて、その中でそのいろんなコラボレーションとかイノベーションとかを起こしていきながら、その、まあ、競争共同の場をこう提供していくというふうなビジョンもお持ちでいらっしゃるということですよね、はい。そうですね。あの、日本のスタートアップがもっともっとこう海外に行くっていうのも、あの、こういった場所を使って、海外のエコシステムとつながることによって生きやすくしていきたいなと思いますし、逆に海外のスタートアップの方が、とかアクセラレーターの方が日本に来るときに、あのー、ネットワークあればいいですけどね、ネットワークがなかったりすると非常に敷居が高いと思います。まあ、こういった東京イノベーションベースにさえ来てもらえれば、ぴったりのパートナーを多分作ることもできますし、あと当然あの、ビザのサポートとかね、あのビジネスを始めるためのいろんな行政的手続きのサポートなんかも東京都はやってますんで、まあ、そういったこともしっかりここを窓口にして、皆さんにご提供したいなと思ってます。はい。あの、今日はあの、海外からベンチャーキャピタリストの方々とか、スタートアップのエコシステムの方々も参加されてるんですけれども、あの、皆さんになんか最後に一言、あの、これ、おなんかおっしゃりたいこととかありますかメッセージとして。はい
じゃあ、あの、この画面だけ写真撮っておいてもらえればですね。<笑><笑>あの、いつでもあの、コンタクトで、我々はあの、オープンに、あの、窓口を開いておきたいと思います。なんで、あの、今すぐでもいいですし、あの、ちょっと考えてからでも構わないんですけど、ちょっと東京でビジネスやってみたいなと。ちょっと興味あるなっていうときにですね、本当気軽にあのお茶でも飲みに来る感覚でコンタクトしてもらえれば、うちのチームがしっかりと間に入って、皆さんと一緒になってやっていきたいなと思ってます。はい。なんかヤフーであの CEO として、日本のインターネット業界を牽引してらした、それがそのまま、その東京都、またはその日本を代表する都市とし、まあ、世界を代表するイノベーションのハブとして、あのブロックチェーンウィークを。小池都知事に持っていかれたんですけども、もっともっとスケールが大きい形でですね、実現できるということで、あの、心から応援してますし、あの、こうやってその、情報の流れを得ることによって、まあ、人物、金が動いて、で、そのいろんなコミュニケーション、コラボレーションができてくるとですね、素晴らしいことだと思いますので、ぜひ実現していただければと思います。よろしくお願いします。はい、ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to have、uh, one more speaker before our next break here.、Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing an old friend of mine, Andrew Chen from Andreessen Horowitz,、uh, who I believe is、uh, celebrating a honeymoon and has been here in Japan、uh, doing a little bit of work and pleasure at the same time.、Uh, Andrew and I have known each other for probably at least 15 years, I think. And、uh, he's uh, really. Uh, Quite a genius, and I would say a really fun person to be around. So he's going to be talking about the new gaming market. And、uh, please give him a welcome round of applause. Thank you. Does this work? Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, well, hello, everyone. And Dave, thank you for, for having me、um, at the, at the,、uh, at the conference.、Um, so,、uh, last year,、um, Andreessen Horwich launched its first ever fund completely focused, dedicated to the video games industry. And of course, being here in Japan, which has made such significant contributions over the past couple of decades, really, it's the category of software that has.、Uh, Worked in Japan and Japan's been able to export globally.、Um, this is just such a critical market. And, and there's a very interesting opportunity to build on the successes of the video games industry here and to build the next generation of startups. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that.、Um, now, many of you may already know that the business of video games is big. And,、uh, and, 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 and of course it is. But the most interesting thing about the business is how much it's changed over the last 20 years. It used to be that you would go to a retail shop and you would go and buy a $40 cartridge. You'd stick it into your Nintendo or your PlayStation or you know, whatever. You'd play it for a bunch of hours. And when you were done with it, you'd kind of put it aside.、Um, and so because of that, The games industry sort of was viewed as, yes, both a highly lucrative industry, but one that was kind of like movies, like a hits driven business that would get you a big spike. And then, you know, that was it. And what's been really, really interesting over the last two decades has been the whole industry has transformed now into something that much more resembles the characteristics of a social network. And of course, here's a screenshot from, from Fortnite, which is often cited. This is, a, this is a product that is、uh, fundamentally free to play. It's multi platform. You play it with your friends. There's constant live updates that are happening. And what that means is people actually hang out with their friends in these environments. And you know, I could have put a,、um, a Fortnite slide here, or it could have been Roblox or League or Minecraft or you know, many of the other big franchises. But really, these products are being used. 
more like social networks than they are these cartridges that you kind of like stick in and, and, and that's it. And, and the reason for that, that makes gaming such a unique entertainment medium is that at its core, games are of course software. And so what that means is that every wave of software that then goes and hits all the other software categories actually comes back and reinvents the gaming industry as well. And so gaming started in arcades and then it came into your home through the console. But then when the PC came and the internet came and mobile came, each of these new technological shifts actually not only changed the way that people could uh, play games, because obviously you could now do it in, in the spare moments while you're waiting in line, or you could do it um, you know, with your friends at a PC bong. But it also meant that the kinds of games that people engaged with were fundamentally changing. And so looking to the future, there's obviously a ton of activity happening in spatial computing. You know, we're, we're waiting on the release of um, Apple's new uh, headset and the Quest 3 and many other projects are, 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 are going through. Um, Web3 has gone through a wave, of course, and a lot of the next generation, everyone's very excited about Web3 gaming. And then, of course, generative AI um, is going to fundamentally change the way not only that gaming experiences happen for consumers, but also the way that they're built. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But each one of these new technologies really changes the industry. And so what we're, what we're really seeing is we're on this precipice of um, a bunch of new waves happening at once. And, and what's really unique about uh, the gaming market is it means that whenever there is a new touch point and there's new formats to be consumed, we're seeing that people actually just consume gaming more and more and more and more. And so you're seeing the revenue just stack on top of each other. And when you contrast that to music or you contrast that to other entertainment media, you know, over here, when we went from vinyl to cassettes to CDs, you know, it the usage and the market was, you know, pretty much the same. And, and what that's meant is in the last two decades, the games industry is now bigger than Hollywood, music, and books combined. I mean, this is a mega, mega industry. And we really believe that this next wave that's happening, driven by AI, driven by spatial computing, driven by Web3, is going to add to this even more. And so the, the, the question then, of course, and for the folks that are, are, are sitting here in Japan, um, having seen so many successes uh, within, within the market here, as well as folks that are, that are overseas that have seen the growth, the question is, how do, you, how do you build the next generation of companies? How do you invest in the next generation of companies that are successful? And so for A16Z, we've really looked at all of this in three kind of large buckets, which I'll just describe to all of you. So the first is, what are the next generation gaming and virtual world experiences going to look like? If you allow for all of these to, to, to resemble the next social network, things that you're playing with your friends, things that you're um, uh, experiencing with, uh, with AI baked in, um, what are the new categories of gameplay that might be, might be allowed? You know, when, when the mobile platform came around, what we saw was uh, uh, many new categories of of, uh, of gaming, and we, we think that the same will happen um, for for these new studios. The second category that we think a lot about is infrastructure, and in particular, how AI is going to fundamentally reinvent the process of building these games. Right. Um, one of the things that's amazing is, is if you go play um, one of these uh, games that's like Cyberpunk or Red Dead Redemption or one of these like kind of huge mega um, uh, franchises, what you'll realize is that every single blade of grass, every single tree, every single um, level and corner has been actually handcrafted by a level designer and by artists that are there. And so, you know, we imagine a world where that's going to be completely different and people are going to instead, whether it's through text prompts or 2D concept art into some of these, or the editing tools are going to be different, or the game engines are going to be different, that each that the, 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 the foundational tooling and the platforms that underlay these games is going to completely shift. And not only is that going to hit gaming, but a lot of those technologies are then going to go to all the other adjacent categories, whether that's 
movies and entertainment, whether that's architecture, whether that's manufacturing, anywhere where 3D is a major component of the industry, I think that that'll that'll be really important. And then and the final one that I want to mention is that you know gaming is an ecosystem, and what we've seen is that there's a lot of new consumer behaviors that exist around gaming. You know that might be streaming, that might be VTubers, that might be esports leagues, that might be all the things that gamers are doing with each other that you wouldn't call it gameplay, but it is adjacent and it supports ultimately gameplay. And these have ended up being multi-billion dollar outcomes, um, wh whether you're talking about Twitch and Discord and some of these. And so these are three three of the, the big categories that we're, we're thinking about. Um, and in particular, AI, I'll just touch on this really uh, you know, briefly. We actually did a, a really interesting um, survey of uh, both the A16Z portfolio as well as the broader set of game companies and studios. And what we saw, this is you know, about uh, 200 companies. And what we saw is the, the games industry is very, very, very forward on, on the adoption of AI. They're already using it uh, significantly for everything from um, art concepting to ChatGPT for um, how you interact with uh, non-player characters inside the games and 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 much more. And so uh, there's big efforts inside of all the big companies, Riot Games, uh, Blizzard, others that are well documented, where um, they they they're you know the whole industry is moving forward on this. So so it's it's definitely one that is it's a very valuable industry that's being transformed right in front of us as we speak. Um, and so as I mentioned last year, Andreessen Horowitz launched its first ever fund focused on the games industry. And so we're 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 doing two things here, right? So one is having a fund that leads series A's and B's. The fund is $660 million in, in our first uh in our first effort. And then we have a we have a second effort that's sort of folded in called Speed Run, which is the first accelerator that acts at the intersection of tech and gaming. And so um, in in the most recent batch, this is actually the the thing that reconnected uh, Dave, Dave and I. Um, you know, most recently we actually had uh, nearly four thousand companies apply, um, and we select you know roughly thirty to forty companies. Um, we invest about five hundred k, and uh, and so this this has been a, a, a really important effort um, for for Andrew Snorowitz. Cool. I'll leave it at that. So I thought we'd uh, have a little bit of an interactive session here and uh, talk a little bit about gaming, maybe talk a little bit about Andreessen and maybe anything else that's on your mind. Yeah, uh, sounds great. Um, I guess to start with, um, so you covered a lot of different topics in gaming and uh, I guess maybe a particular interest has been there's there was a rush of interest in uh, various forms of crypto, uh, some of those combined with gaming. Uh, I think there's several different gaming environments that were trying to incentivize play with tokens. And that worked fantastic for a little while and then maybe not so much. Um, so any thoughts about whether that's completely dead, whether we're going to see a resurgence in that, how, how does sort of crypto and gaming fit together? Uh, and then maybe if it's different, I don't know about blockchain gaming is now, everybody sort of said like, Oh, crypto is a bad word, but we can still say blockchain. So let's say blockchain <laughs> gaming. <laughs> And and maybe if you can comment on one of the bigger players in the industry, Animoca, uh, I think. Yeah, I think uh, so. So so first, I want to just say that um, uh, one of the most interesting things about the games industry is that whenever there's a new technology wave, games is very nearly at the front of 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 that cutting edge. And so you guys may know this, but it's I mean it's amazing to think about now. But the first um, real 3D engine was built. Um, you know, on not not to do you know Pixar or whatever. It's it was to do it was to build games. It was John Carmack building building uh, 3D engines. Um, you know the 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 fact that Nvidia exists and the GPU. I mean, the first GPU was actually integrated into a Nintendo cartridge. Um, you know, amazingly enough. And and so you know, and then when you look at VR and when you look at uh, Web three, no wonder the first thing that people want to do with it is they want to figure out how to build these entertainment entertainment experiences. So I I think. I think first and foremost, that is a common recurring pattern. It's one of the reasons why the industry is is so exciting. I think for Web three in particular, you know, look, I mean, I think um, it's it's undergone a very experimental period where people are trying a lot of 
consumer facing apps and trying to see what works. And I think, um, you know, at least from from my perspective, and we certainly have a good chunk of uh, our, our fund invested into Web3 Gaming, um, you know, the way that we evaluate it is first and foremost, you need to build a game that's actually fun, that engages people. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 really that simple. And then I think the reality in the games industry is that um, people have been, you know, all, all those big revenue charts that, that you were looking at, a, a huge chunk of that is already being driven by virtual goods. I mean, and obviously the underlying technology is not necessarily blockchain, um, but I think the gamers and consumers are very... Uh, comfortable with that construct, and so I think t- to me it's a it's an inevitability. Now, you know what what uh, blockchain is going to be built on. Um, you know what's going to be the you know can you sell uh, virtual land before you actually ship the game? Like all these mechanics, I think it's obviously uh, all, all in the details. And I think the founders that are uh, really passionate about the space are going to have to figure that out. But I think you know first and foremost they got to they got to ship a really really good game. So uh, you you mentioned a few examples in the beginning, and I don't know too much about these personally. I just know that my kids have spent a lot of time on them over the years. But uh, uh, Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite, I I saw my kids go through each of those sort of generations and changes, I guess. Uh, Minecraft first, Roblox second, and then Fortnite third. I don't know what's next or whether they're doing other stuff or... Um, but those were huge environments. I'm sure they're still huge. Um, so probably no question that gaming is an enormous market. I don't know if I, are there stats you have on sort of like, you know, domestic U S or global spend annually on gaming? Yeah. Well, well, what what I would say is, you know, um, to, to make it really concrete. I mean, when you have a hit, you can have basically a billion dollar high margin revenue line that seems to exist in perpetuity right i mean i think that 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 is that is what we're ultimately aiming for and when you look at um a property like world of warcraft i mean world of warcraft is 20 years old right it's a subscription based thing and um you know and it's still doing you know billion dollars of recurring revenue i mean there's there's very few uh uh you know um digital franchises that have that kind of staying power. And so I think, you know, the the and 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 that is why it's it's such an exciting place to invest in is you you sort of have especially with season passes and um you know distribution through creators and streamers. You kind of have all the benefits of we building infinite view of ourselves. Right <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Trippy. Yes. Well, in, it's into the metaverse. Right. Um into infinity. So, you know, it, it has all the benefits of a social network, which is that they grow virally and organically. Um, but you also monetize, you know, quite, quite well. And then you have the network effects that give it staying power over, you know, now quite a few franchises are, are, are several decades old. So uh, maybe a couple of other areas that I find fascinating. Uh, you mentioned AI, which is obviously on everybody's mind, but I kind of want to bring up something that blew my mind about three, four years ago. Uh, how many people in the audience know who or what KDA is? Oh, you guys are such old people. I feel so much younger now. Come on, KDA? No clue. Two people out of 100. Okay. All right, three, four. I'm 57. I know what KDA is all about. You guys are out of touch. Uh, Andrew, could you give us a short overview? So I, I'm just fascinated with like that group came on the you know, basically a K-pop music group, sort of US, sort of Korea, produced by League of Legends, fantastic music, fantastic video, hundreds of millions of views. It's like in top 20 videos, I think. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, I think the, the, look, I mean, you know, it's as, as you can tell from some of the charts and some of the conversations that we've had. Amy in the room, can somebody tee up that video? Let's play it. (laughs) Please. It's like, Um, it's worth watching. It's super fun. The, 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 because gaming is is not just software, it's something that can be a cultural phenomenon. I think we're seeing a lot of really interesting kind of um, you know jumps across media. I mean, this year we had Last of Us, we had the you know Super Mario movie, we had um, uh, you know the Harry Potter video game, which was huge. I mean, each one of these were huge successes, and I and I, and I think we're just going to see more and more of that. And and the 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 Riot Games people, of course. Um, they also created Arcane, which is on Netflix. Fan- highly fantastic, fan like the best, not just animated series on Netflix, like the best drama 
creative like series in my opinion the artwork's amazing right. the storylines are amazing the music is amazing like it's fucking fantastic that's right and and i think that that is actually why um we're going to look at video games as far as kind of broader ip the way that i think we look at comic books right now yeah it's like it's not just one th- it's like games merchandising movies that's right music that's right you have the characters tickets. you have it's exactly that's right everything and and so like let's jump into ai so like i don't know what the creative effort was behind riot to put that together uh it it was astonishing like I, legit people were like hey this is like better than most k-pop that i see it's like better than most other music videos it was produced by a gaming company uh ostensibly to like you know sell games but like as its own art form it was pretty fucking fantastic um yeah, and, and the Riot folks have been great at that in particular because they they did that. They also obviously pioneered the whole esports scene as well. And and then, you know, Arcane and, you know, they have a bunch of other things that they're working on. So no, it's, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, so I kind of want more. And I guess my question is, hey, will AI allow us to start doing uh-huh. more of that faster? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be wild. I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the, the um, you know, metaphors I use is, look, you can be, if you're JK Rowling and you decide that you want to, um, you know, write the next installment of Harry Potter, all you have to do is go grab your thousand dollar laptop and go to a cafe and just start typing. And after you're done, you know, it might take you a while, but after you're done, you publish that and then boom, it's out there and, you know, a billion people might read it. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's that, that's how it works. Amazingly, though, if you think about writing a book or taking a picture, right, it is very, very different as soon as you get to more complex forms of media. How many people does it take to make a Marvel movie? Um, you know, I don't know, hundred, hundreds, right? Thousands, like, thousands, you know, I mean, sure. like, it's huge, right? Um, hundred million, like, easy. Right, right, exactly. Million, right? That's right. That's right. And then, you know, and then, you, and then you ask the same question about building a video game. It's like, yeah, I mean, these video game teams are measured in the hundreds for a reason. And so I asked the question, like the other thing is like the gaming market is three times the size right, of the right. movie market. <laughs> yes, like, yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I didn't realize yeah. that stat when I was yes. looking at that. Like, yeah. like, well, that's why I always ask people that are actually doing both. I was just at Sony earlier uh, today. Um, and, and I love asking the question, do you think of your, you know, the movies more as advertising for the video games or, or is that, or is that vice versa? And, you know, look, I mean, the, the answer is both, but, but it, it is a very you know interesting point. And so, but just to close on my, my JK Rowling point, you know, I think we're going to get to a, get to some configuration where a, an extremely talented individual, the same way that they can go to a cafe, open up Google Docs, and then just start typing and write a book that reaches a ton of people, that we're going to have that same thing, but the output of it is going to be a single person sitting down, doing the work, and then boom, a insane, you know, something at the at the um, at the level of uh, of of uh, you know Red Dead Redemption, you know, pops out or GTA pops out that previously would have taken three hundred million dollars and hundreds or thousands of people to to to, to do it, and we're going to get we're going to be able to now do it might one be person. a lot less expensive, a lot faster. That's right, yeah, and and I think you know there's an interesting question then of like, okay, well, do the do the insiders who are really good at this stuff benefit, or is it going to be all of a sudden the millions of people that don't have the talent? To, to make an interactive experience that when given the tools, they're going to do what folks have been doing on YouTube and TikTok, which is you're going to have a new class of creators that should, can build things be, that like are really hard to imagine. Should be, should be driving down price point for creation and driving down the size of teams. And like, I think, you know, I would, I would guess you'd be able to make a lot more bets and a lot smaller teams to come up with some incredible, you know, content and ROI. That's right. That's right. Um, I guess we're in Japan and uh, we were just recently in Korea. Uh, these are two places that are kind of punching above their weight in terms of cultural output, particularly in music, animation, video, games. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're familiar with Miyazaki's work and all, all of that. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in, your- in fact, during my honeymoon, I went to Yakushima, which is the island. It's a kind of Japanese rainforest island that inspired Princess Mononoke, which oh, is great. Oh, wow. yeah, cool. Uh, and I, I think the new museum is open. I haven't been to the new new museum yet. Um, so, do, does your investing get into those territories? I guess I've always been, you know, wondering why a lot of the animation shops and studios that do work they're kind of tiny, like that they're relatively small operations here in Japan. Uh, there's a huge amount of animation that happens in Korea and the Philippines and other places, but like, 
why not put more venture capital into those? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think, uh, let, let me say two things. So um, this week, actually, we have a bunch of A16Z people here. Actually, Ben, ben Horowitz is in, is in Tokyo right now, and we actually have been doing a bunch of really interesting events. We actually had um, the um, uh, the prime minister actually come to um, uh, a, a dinner setup that we had yesterday um, with him and Ben talking about startups in in Japan. So there, there's a big effort um, this week to to spend more time in this ecosystem. And and I, and I think the reason is um, uh, you know is many fold. I mean, one is um, after several. And this is you know sort of what we ended up talking about, which is after several decades of you know sort of flatness in the economy. I think there's a new newfound desire to take more risk and to you know do more and and part of that has to come from innovation and of course Japan has such a long history of uh, innovation through all the different products that um, have have been created and and introduced to the United States and so part of it is unlocking all of that talent so I think we're very excited about that and then I think for Andrews and Horowitz we um, you know not only have the games fund we have. Uh, you know, a team that's focused on health and health and bio. Um, we have a team that's focused on um, American dynamism, which is sort of government and defense and education and a bunch of it's other. It's time areas. to build, Andrew. Yeah, it's a time to build. Exactly, that's right. And so, um, and so because of that, there there's a lot of really integration, really interesting integration points. And then I think, you know, to your to your question specifically about kind of, um, you know, what what do we invest in? What do we do? I think what we're what we're finding in the games industry is that. Every one of the startups that we invest in has a strategy for how they want to um, uh, interact with Japan, and sometimes it's working with uh, the Sony's and Nintendos for, from a publishing standpoint. Sometimes it's potentially licensing IP that's been you know inside of all of these uh, you know various various studios and figuring yep. out what to do with them. A ton of amazing content. Tons of amazing content. Yeah. So I think I think there's there's definitely a lot of interest. And in a world where you could take um, you know Miyazaki's work and use it as an input into some AI you know, 3D models that would world. then build an open world and I can have like a open world Princess Mononoke. Like that sounds awesome. Like that's what I want. Right. And so I'm I think, exposing I think my nudiness here, but like, um, <laughs> I, how, how many of you like watch AI generated trailers on YouTube? There's like 30 second AI generated trailers, like reimagining Star Wars done by Tarantino, uh, reimagining Henry Potter done. That's right. That's right. Uh, as, as, a, whole... as, a, as a Balenciaga commercial. Balenci right. right. I was just going to say the Balenciaga yeah. like style is like amazing. Um, I, I really want us to show the KDA video. Can someone work on finding that for after the break? It's literally like the most number of views for any gaming video. Um, so we we talked a little bit about Andreessen, and I guess we could probably spend another hour on this topic. Uh, but um, I, I guess I've been watching since 2010. It's been a, an incredible uh, run and growth, and I think you guys are pretty much the largest VC on the planet by either body. Maybe not by dollars but pretty close maybe after masa san although we'll see uh but by bodies i think and probably by funds um, yeah do you yeah, know how I, many funds there are that you guys are operating at this uh, point uh well what, what i was gonna say so i so i joined the firm six years ago and i think we had you know maybe 80 people and i think we're we're at five maybe 550 or something like that yeah uh, for for the entire team kind of overall and, and i think you know the the reason why there's Sorry, that's 80 people in the investment team 550 people Sorry, total. I, what i meant was when i joined um in 2018 the whole firm was maybe 80 people okay. and we've since hired now you're up to yeah now we're 550 overall that's everybody right and and the reason why i mentioned that is because um, you know, most of those people, the vast majority are not investors. I mean, I think right. one of the uh, big new things that we did um, that we're continuing to do is to actually have most of the 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 folks on the team um, as people who uh, help the the startups actually be successful platform as opposed to as opposed to being investors. and and so what that means is, you know for for the games fund, we've gone out and hired people that are from, Supercell and Riot and Twitch and Blizzard and YouTube and you know all, all, all the all the top game games companies with the idea that that's you know th those are the kinds of backgrounds and um, where anybody we can actually help with people. Netflix, anybody from Netflix to do uh, show running? <laughs> we we definitely have some Netflix people on on the team, um, you know, overall. But yeah, not 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 yet for for show writing specifically. So so on this idea of like. Starting funds, funding funds. I guess we we have a, a large 
conversation about fund of funds earlier this morning. We have one coming up later after this. You guys are kind of your own fund of funds in a way. Uh, you know, how do you think about how does Andreessen Horowitz management think about starting a new fund, who to run those funds, how much money to put behind it. So, you know, Ben and yeah. Mark just like coming up with their own ideas. Is that a democratic process? Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. So I think, I think, look, I think um, uh, what we have found is that there is a tremendous amount of value if you're talking about going into an ecosystem that doesn't really understand venture capital, doesn't really understand, you know, potentially what A16Z is to be able to say, Hey, you know what, we're planning the flag and, you know, this is the games fund and this is the crypto fund. And this is the, you know, $660 million used to be like an entire market, not just one (laughs) fund. Like that was like 10 different funds. Yes. And so, so, you know, what, what we find is that by, by creating these dedicated vehicles, it, really lets the founders know that we're serious about the space. It's not just something where, oh, it's kind of this little side project that we're doing. It's like a real thing and we have real people that are dedicated to to the actual fund. And so I think, you know, we plan to keep doing new things. And so, you know, what that means is I fully expect that, you know, we'll have we'll continue this process of um, building these new vertical funds. And then I think some of our LP partners um, are that, you know, have been um, you know, fantastic uh, collaborators over the years. Oh, one of which I believe is now the Tokyo government. <laughs> no comment. Um, and so, <laughs> so you know, but but what one of the one of the uh, you know one of the pluses of of um, you know working with with some of our partners and these are all the major endowments and pension funds and um, you know and and sovereigns and so on is that they often want to invest in kind of the A16Z umbrella and support you know a whole number of. You know, funds kind of underneath that, and so, um, so we 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 were very pleased. Uh, you know, when we when we launched the games fund, that um, you know, the the uptake among the LP base was was so fantastic. So six hundred and sixty million dollars, I believe the the bar the golden bar for a VC fund is three x. Uh, I was I was always a question whether that's three x net or three x gross. Uh, but let's say three x net for the moment. So that's uh, what two billion dollars, roughly speaking. That you need to return. Uh, let's say you own, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 percent at maturity IPO, maybe. So six times two billion, five times two billion. So how do you feel uh, about how, trying to yeah, generate how, how, ten how you billion dollars worth of returns in order to be a successful six hundred and sixty million dollar yeah. VC fund? Well, look, I think I think one of the things that we've seen over the last 10 years has been the actual tremendous number of really, really interesting companies like Roblox, like Supercell and Riot, um, you know, like uh, Mo-, Mo Yang, which which created Minecraft. Um, you know, there's there's so many interesting companies. How, how many of those do you think you need to be a successful VC fund? Because I think it's more than one. <laughs> no, no, it's more than one. It's more right. than one. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, and but I but I also think that um, uh, because the market is expanding so much. That the exits in this space and the kinds of companies we're going to build are just going to be much, much bigger. Um, so, than, than there is. what do those companies look like numeric wise? Well, I think um, I think you know the the most interesting companies are certainly the ones that are that clear the ten billion dollar right. plus. So it's not just a there. unicorn; it's a decacorn. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And 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 I think a, a lot of these companies end up not just being games studio companies that just have multiple games but they often have you know like if you look at um valve or you look at epic you know they often have a game engine business or store business you know they have their own platform that they're building i think those are all very interesting and then i think the other part i would add to this is um you know it it's there's uh it's it's really really beneficial that we're doing this at the same time as the ai revolution because i think it's you know these AI companies that are being started that initially target the games industry are going to ultimately be able to go after many, many more verticals. Um, and so I think that that's exciting and it's kind of undefined as to how big those could be at that, at the moment. Okay. Two last crazy questions before we wrap up here. So when do you invest in an entrepreneur that's an AI? Does that happen? How long? When or if does an AI take over your job and start doing <laughs> investments? So when does AI replace entrepreneurs? When does AI replace VCs? Is that going to happen? 
How long is it going to have? How much time do I have before I don't got a job anymore? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think the um, uh, two, two, two parts of this, I think we all benefit everyone in this room. We all benefit with the fact that um, uh, the most interesting companies and the biggest trends are are ones where there's no priors there's no data you know around it i mean if you were to if you were to look at all the data around uh you know um uh, some of the great companies we've been we've been in, in, involved with um and you were to say okay we're going to build a marketplace for um you know shared homes you're like well how much data is there that that's going to be a real thing it's i fucking passed, one and done. i fucking passed on airbnb and i'm an idiot were you, were you trying to like, use uh, prior data to I, train your, you know? <laughs> I saw Brian when he was pitching the cereal boxes. I thought that was fucking stupid. My mistake. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I think because of that, um, some of the, the most interesting companies, there's just no data that it's going to work. And it's very speculative. And because of that, it's it's one of the things I would I would guess is is, uh, you know, some of the, the hardest to just build a hist- historical model and then try to you know, uh, predict something. Actually, interestingly, there were a series of VC firms, I think this would have been 10 years ago, that tried to use, you know, build these big data models to tr- try to figure out, okay, you know, what kind of founders, what kind of schools, what did they major in? Is Are is two founders better or is three founders? You know, you pattern, can build these models. Pattern match. And 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 one of the interesting things that you learn from the pattern matching is your, your, your model is just going to constantly output, the startup's going to fail. <laughs> over and over and over again, and the reason is because like, of them do because they all fail, you know. So, <laughs> so if you're if you're literally looking, for by the way, most VCs fail too. <laughs> really? Yes. Um. And so, so, so I, I do think that the, you know you you end up uh, in 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 a situation where um, if you just don't have any priors, it's just unclear how you know how the, how that's going to. Come on, let's get down to the numbers here. Will an AI replace? An entrepreneur and you will you make will you make a well, five ten million dollar bet on an, on an AI at some point? Well, I was going to say you know one of the interesting things with that people were investing in were these DAOs that kind of were like automated like you know and we were saying things, that we're going to replace know? VC DAOs like, we're going to replace venture capital funds. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I I think um I think because the most interesting opportunities will always be very very novel. I hope that uh, it's it's uh, you know that we're safe from being replaced by AIs for a long time. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, Andrew, thanks again for joining us, and uh, good luck with that six hundred sixty million dollar fund. No pressure, buddy. <laughs>